King Charles is diagnosed with cancer as the Princess of Wales slams reports that she was comatose after surgery. Royal historian Gareth Russell comments on Harry's return to London after the King Charles news. Regardless of what's happened, you hear your father has cancer and you're in the financial and social position where you can go um, um, last minute to see him. So I, I would imagine that could be it. Plus, YouTube star P. Dinah gives us her take on Harry and Meghan's upcoming Netflix ventures. Definitely, they're going to be doing something around their personal lives because that's the only way people really will tune in. We've got that plus so much more in today's Royally Us. Hey everyone, I'm Christina and that's Christine and welcome to Royally Us. And wow, Christine, this was not the news we expected this week. No, absolutely not. I really thought that the health news we had a few weeks ago was going to be the most dramatic thing we would talk about. And here we are less than two weeks later with a huge, you know, dramatic turn of events. Right, yeah. I mean, as I'm sure everybody knows already, but King Charles was diagnosed with cancer. Uh, Buckingham Palace announced the news on Monday and said during the King's recent hospital procedure for benign prostate enlargement, a separate issue of concern was noted. Subsequent diagnostic tests have, been, have identified a form of cancer. Now, Buckingham Palace did not specify what form of cancer it was or what stage it was found, but Britain's prime minister did say it was caught early and um, King Charles spent the night at home and he has already begun treatment. The palace said he remains wholly positive, but will have to postpone, pu postpone public facing duties and public engagements. The king will, st will still carry out state business and official paperwork as usual. Meanwhile, as we know, Prince Harry got right on a plane, jetted off to London, and he is now there with his father. Um, a lot to unpack here. And, you know, thankfully, they did catch it early. Thankfully, he did begin treatment. But like we said, we don't really know what stage this is in, what type of cancer. But nice that his family is there with him. Yeah, absolutely. It's, you know, we've heard it was caught early. The The message from the palace is that they are very optimistic. There's really, although it is a very serious diagnosis, there's not a huge cause for concern. He'll obviously receive the best medical treatment that, you know, that in the world, really. Um, we saw him shortly after visiting with Prince Harry. The king has gone up to Sandringham for a time to sort of relax and recover. He's receiving outpatient treatment. So he is able to to go home and have that, you know, relaxed downtime. He's not full time in hospital, which I think is, again, a sign that while this is a, a serious diagnosis, the treatment is not as um, invasive as with more severe forms of cancer. So this is a huge um, turn of events. But I also think that it's incredibly significant that we've received this press release that we know yeah. that the king is suffering mm -hmm. with cancer that we were informed so quickly and um with detail that we really never have seen before from the royal mm -hmm. family right no you make an interesting point but i was also thinking maybe they if it wasn't as severe as maybe we think they maybe they could tell us that because then you know all the speculation then happens being you know, like yeah, did harry get on the plane <laughs> because I, it was so severe, you know? I think we can sort of get into roundabouts where it's sort of like, well, would they tell us if it was that severe? Would okay. Harry come if it was that, if it wasn't that serious? Yes. Or they're telling us that the king, and I mean, the king looks, he was at church on Sunday. Mm -hmm. He was, we right. saw him today leaving Clarence house. He looks in very good spirits. He looks quite healthy in a strange way. So, mm -hmm. you know, only time will tell and we really can just, you know, keep our thoughts with him and remain optimistic. Uh, but the message from the palace is that they are wholly optimistic about his treatment, yeah. about his health from mm -hmm. here. Uh, but again, yes, we can definitely get caught up in sort of circles saying, but then this happened, does that mean it's actually right. bad? But then this happened, does that mean it's not that bad? No, it's so true. But thankfully, you know, it, this was an incidental finding. You know, they had no idea that this was, it has nothing to do with the prostate. But, you know, they were there and they caught it. And hopefully, um, you know, treatment goes well. And of course, we will keep you updated as we get news. But um, we're going to talk a little bit more about this with Gareth coming up and how this will affect the monarchy going forward. Because, you know, we're only 18 months into his reign. Princess Kate is just coming off of her own surgery. So we're only two months, uh, not even two months into this year, and we're already dealing with a lot of health crisis within the monarchy. I, know, I can't believe it. We're really seeing, I, we'll talk about it later with Gareth, but this is, you know, the monarchy is sort of, it's, it's a huge upheaval for them. Um, all right, well, let's get into uh, the Princess of Wales because this is a crazy story. Um, she was not comatose after undergoing a planned abdominal surgery. A royal source told us weekly there's absolutely no truth to the report that Kate was in a coma. She was recovering at home. She underwent, like we know, a medical procedure before uh, journalist Concha 
Calja falsely claimed on the Spanish news program Fiesta that the princess was in a coma after complications. Um, you know, this comes after Prince William is headed back to work and he undertook a mourning of investors on behalf of his father, King Charles. Um, and he did this on Wednesday. So the event will, uh, saw Prince William reward members of the public and other prominent people with honors that are awarded at New Year or to mark the monarch's birthday. It just shows how quickly rumors can spread because, uh, you know, this journalist obviously put out what she thought was proper information and it just catches like wildfire. It's unbelievable. I mean, it's a really, it, it shows how fast the rumors and the misinformation can spread and how quickly people can buy into it, but also mm -hmm. how much frenzy there is. There's so much speculation right now about the Princess of Wales' health, now the King's health. People are just guessing. Everyone is suddenly a medical expert. <laughs> and right. No, it's we all have to step back and sort of listen to the press releases and the information we're, be giving, we're being given directly from the palace. It's so true. It is. Um, well, in the midst of all this, Prince Edward said that he was the latest royal to take a break from royal duties. The Telegraph reported on January 31st that he is taking a brief hiatus after completing his overseas trips to Commonwealth countries, South Africa and British territory, St. Helena, earlier this month. Now, during the trip, he said um, hello to the same 192-year-old tortoise his late mother, Queen Elizabeth, met during her 1947 visit as a princess. That's quite the accomplishment. Um, he His next appearance won't be until February. It's not a big break. It's just like a week and a half. But yes. I feel like this also caught on like wildfire too, because you're allowed to take a week vacation. <laughs> Especially after it was, a, it was a long tour. He was, it was a solo tour, which is sort of difficult yeah. to do yourself. Uh, all the mm -hmm. attention is on you in a sense, although it wasn't a hugely publicized, um, right. a hugely publicized tour. Uh, but I think what this is really highlighting is when you look at the court circular, you see who, which working royals are out working right now. It's mm -hmm. literally just Princess Anne. <laughs> and so perhaps yeah, right. they wanted some explanation for why the Duke of Edinburgh wasn't working this, you know, some, some sort of filler is, you know, he's taking a bit of a break after his tour, which is totally fair, but definitely a, a sign of this slim down monarchy and is yeah. this the best decision. Right, and which we have talked about um, several times, but Princess Anne, hardest working royal. I feel like her calendar is always jam-packed. <laughs> well, all right, well, let's break down the royal rules, and joining us now is royal historian Gareth Russell. Well, Gareth, it is great to see you as always. Um, so let's get, I mean, let's get right into it. What was your reaction when you heard the news of King Charles? Well, obviously, as with anyone with a cancer diagnosis, there's sadness for them for their family you know i think obviously with the king having gone in for treatment for an enlarged prostate it's not totally unheard of for something else to be picked up upon it's also worth noting that when the king was in hospital for that treatment his wife queen camilla was visiting him twice a day which indicated obviously you know a, a wife with her husband but also that maybe there were concerns about him during that period so sadness um surprise but not shock i think sort of to alliterate there would be how i would how i would land on my reaction circling back to harry a lot of people mm. and even christine and i you know you had the speculation like he got right on the plane is it this more severe than maybe we expected or does it just show where maybe charles and harry are in their relationship mm. now I suppose it could be both. Uh, it it mm -hmm. could be that it's more severe. It could be that Prince Harry, it, it could be that Prince Harry, like many people, when they hear news like that, everything else goes out the window and they just want to be with their, their parent, even if maybe the relationship has been a bit strained before. I think it's it's worth pointing out that, um, I think the last time we were talking about this, Christina, I was in the studio with you. It was right after Omid Scobie's book Endgame came out. Mm -hmm. And you tend to forget that just before that, the Sussexes had kind of been putting out uh, what seemed like a breadcrumb trail in the media that they did want more of a reconciliation. Mm -hmm. You had the, the, the outreach for King Charles's birthday from them. And then Endgame created a bit more of a public relations problem for them when it came to that. Mm -hmm. So maybe actually Prince Harry is just following the inclination that he had before, before Endgame. That is possible. But again, you can't rule out just strong human spontaneous emotion of regardless of what's happened, you hear your father has cancer and you're in the financial and social position where you can go um, um, last minute to see him. So I, I would imagine that could be it. Um, but 
uh, all the statements coming from the palace about the severity of the king's condition is that like any cancer, it has to be taken seriously, but that the king is immensely grateful and relieved to the medical staff for having um, spotted it so soon. So so we'll see that that still remains to be to be confirmed. What does this mean for the monarchy going forward? And I, I'm really specifically thinking about this slimmed down monarchy that mm. King Charles has created. Yeah, what a great question, Christine. So um, where the slim down monarchy is something that really needs to be set in context. And I think it's a really useful starting point for this discussion. Princess Anne gave an interview to Canadian television last year where she said, look, it was when this conversation started, you have to remember how big the royal family was. So when the, the initial conversation started about a slim down monarchy, it was the year 2000. And at that point, the Queen Mother and Princess Margaret were still alive. That's how long ago we're talking. And you had a monarch and her spouse, her four children, her mother, her sister, and four of her cousins, I believe. Um, the Duke of, yeah, the Duke of Duchess of Kent, Duke of Duchess of Gloucester. I'm sorry, five, six, six working cousins. Sorry, I went up a number there. So you had a very large amount of working royals at that time. Mm -hmm. And it was assumed that there would be a kind of natural slimming. Obviously, the Queen Mother and Princess Margaret died old age it would come to us all. All right. Well, Gareth always has such great insight into literally everything. Um, all right. Well, let's spill some royalty. And joining us now is P. Dinah. She is a YouTube star and talks all about the royals on her channel. So we wanted to get her to spill the tea on what's going on with Harry and Meghan. Take a look. There's a new book that is um, coming out saying, as we know that Meghan has kind of been the catalyst for the brother, brother's bitter, bitter fallout, but a new report actually mm -hmm. claims that they were already at odds over their differing approaches to charity work. So an explosive piece was mm. just published by the Times of London, and it cites several palace sources who say the siblings squabbled over the best way to address the conservation of African wildlife. They said they are both very passionate about saving protected species, but didn't always share the same view about how to run projects in Africa. So I'd love to get your take on this, mm. and if you feel like this maybe was the start of their feud, and it just kind of snowballed from there. Yeah, I think that is going to always be something that happens with family brothers mm -hmm. working together. You're going to always have issues where we don't agree on things, mm -hmm. but I think they would have worked it out. They would have come to an agreement had the marriage not been the influence to, I think, more strife between the brothers. Um, I think it's just been perpetuated by the, the wife and her agenda. I believe she has an agenda and mm -hmm. Harry's trying to follow that agenda and that component makes it a lot more difficult. So I, I think they would have worked it out. And I don't see that they, you know, having issues prior, you know, before the marriage or, you know, before it became public, that that would have been a big issue for them because they've had, you know, issues growing up that they've always managed to work out. Mm -hmm. I think it's just compounded things with Harry and his marriage right now. So, um, and that's going to make it a lot harder because you have a third person mm -hmm. involved in, well, actually four, if you count the wife of, of William. So it, it's just one of those things where you just, you look at the issues in, and you know, it's going to be hard to work out because of the other elements, the other people in the relationship now, the wives, mm -hmm. the brothers could have managed this a, a lot easier by themselves but they're married now so yeah christine you agree yeah i i i do agree that we sort of we know that there's always been little sibling squabbles between them disagreements that i think is normal between between brothers siblings especially when you work in really um close proximity to each other but there was sort of a larger catalyst it was these big life changes getting married having children that really you know sent them into you know, fully opposite directions where they, you know, almost clearly can't be in the same room together. So while, yeah, I agree that they had these sort of, there were issues bubbling under the surface, but I think they probably could have been smoothed over very easily if we hadn't had these massive, um, you know, relationship changes, these life changes right. that were the catalyst for a bigger fallout. Patricia, you said before, you know, you think that Megan kind of has an agenda or something planned. And we recently found out what Netflix has planned for them coming up. They have several upcoming projects already in the works. Um, Bella Majaria, she's a, the streaming platform's chief content officer, said during a press event that the couple have um, unscripted things that they're working on. 
um, scripted TV series, a movie. Um, they're developing, like I said, a featured length movie and a scripted series. They're all very early developments. But what do we think about this, you know, as they're continuing this multi-year deal, Netflix poured a lot of money into them. And some of the projects obviously were successful with their docu-series. Some of them were not. But I mean, what do you think that they have planned going forward? Well, I think for their unscripted work, it has to be some kind of reality with their mm -hmm. personal lives because Netflix, that was very much on the table that they had to do something, you know, a fly on the wall type of scenario. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what they're going to be doing. Um, to what extent they're going to be showing their personal lives, I, I don't know, but definitely they're going to be doing something around their personal lives because that's the only way people really will tune in. Um, we've seen with live to lead and we've seen with their other project um invictus um the heart of invictus that they didn't really get the numbers that they wanted and people will tune in to see their personal lives yeah. so that that's what they have to do and i know there's pushback from them they don't want to do that but i think they're compromising to some extent and highlighting some of their charity work and mm -hmm. some things that are important to them but certain instances will have to be them. I mean, you think about what they did in the Netflix documentary that they did. They did show some of the behind the scenes fly on the wall type work that was successful. So they'll continue to do that in a very scripted way, although it is for unscripted show. So yeah, they'll do that. Um, we know they have this meet me at the lake show that they're mm -hmm. their movie that they're going to be working on. And I find it interesting that Netflix actually purchased the rights to this movie, not Harry and Megan, right. because I think if they don't work the way that, you know, Netflix wants them to work on this project, that they own the rights and they can easily get rid of Harry and Megan's, you know, Archwell Productions to work on that film. So I think they're still giving them a little leeway and help and support, but they're very careful to see, okay, to what extent are we going to see you behind your closed doors and how well will you help to do this movie, uh, Meet Me by the Lake. So, you know, they're still in, but I think hanging on by a thread, most definitely. All right, let's wrap it up with our Pine Size Palace and Princess Kate's abdominal surgery recovery has been enriched by her three little helpers. Um, a source told Us Weekly that Kate's procedure went well and she's still recovering and that her kids have been hands-on since she returned home from the hospital. They said they've all made her some get well soon cards along with some of her favorite snacks. I would imagine like uh, those are her three biggest helpers and I'm sure they're just very happy to have mom home. I know it's, it's so sweet to think I'm sure they were the most beautiful get well soon cards and those yeah. you and I both know those are the most meaningful those are the best mm -hmm. cards are the ones made with crayon but I think we're all dying to know what her favorite snacks are like specifically <laughs> which snacks. <laughs> Seriously, what is helping her get well? But that's, yes, nothing is better than uh, homemade cards, a big hug, and I'm sure she'll be well on her way to a speedy recovery. All right, well, Christine, thank you so much. That is it for this week's episode of Royal ES. This was a huge, huge week. I mean, hopefully next week we don't have quite so much historical, you know, dramatic news to report on. Seriously, definitely. All right. Well, in the meantime, keep commenting, keep subscribing, and we'll see you next week. For more news content and exclusive interviews, make sure to hit the sub, like, and bell button down below and visit usmagazine.com.